name is Adam Risson. I am the rewilding advocate with Wild Earth Guardians, and I am pleased to be uh, presenting today's webinar. And joining me is Judy Brower, our Wild Places Program Director, um, and she is going to be moderating uh, the chat window. Um, but just uh, before we get into those details, I just want to give a little bit of overview of Wild Earth Guardians. Uh, we fight to protect and restore wildlife, wild places, wild rivers, and the health of the American West. Our Wild Places program, and specifically our Re Rewilding initiative, focuses on restoring wildness to public lands scarred by decades of exploitation and mismanagement, and to reconnect wildlife habitat and waterways across the American West through advocacy, education, and the effective use of the law. Um, I'm pleased to join with uh, Flathead Lolo Bitterroot Citizens Task Force today to bring this webinar to everybody. Uh, we often work with the task force and they're a great partner. And again, uh, Judy is going to be handling the technical issues um, and all attendees right now are on mute and will stay on mute. I do encourage questions uh, to be posed using the chat window that you can access at the bottom of the Zoom window. Uh, so everyone should be able to see a little Zoom, a uh, little chat icon. And uh, I do encourage all questions to be typed in. Uh, Judy will be moderating those questions and I'll be posing those uh, that we're able to ask to our panelists. Um, I also have several questions that I'll be uh, posing to our panelists today uh, to kind of help keep the discussion going. Uh, this webinar is being recorded and will be available on Guardian's YouTube channel. Uh, it is also being streamed live on Facebook. Uh, so now it is my pleasure to introduce our panelists. Um, I'd like to start with Dr. Fred Allendorf. He is a leading conservation geneticist and is currently Regent Professor of Biology Emeritus at the University of Montana and a board member of the National Academy of Arts and Scientists. Um, sciences. He has been a Fulbright Scholar and was awarded the 2015 Molecular Ecology Award for Lifetime Achievements in the fields of molecular ecology and conservation genetics. Uh, Pete Frost uh, is joining us. Uh, he is an attorney with Western Environmental Law Center and has more than two decades of experience litigating in federal and state courts to preserve the West's forest, rivers, wildlife, and wilderness. He is a recipient of the David Brower Lifetime Achievement Award for Environmental Litigation and represents Wild Earth Guardians and other clients in a lawsuit to end bear baiting inside grizzly bear habitat. Uh, and finally, Mike Bader is joining us as an independent consultant in Missoula, involved in grizzly bear management and recovery issues for decades, all the way back to the 1980s. Uh, he is a co-author of a recent report titled Road Density and Grizzly Bears in the Nine Mile Demographic Connectivity Area in Montana. And we'll be learning more about that. Um, so before we delve into the specific questions, uh, both Dr. Allendorf and Mr. Bader have short presentations to provide some context and information for our discussion. I'll be sharing my screen to display their slides and everyone again is welcome to type their questions in the chat box as you may think of them. Um, so with that, I will uh, turn it over to Dr. Allendorf as soon as I share my screen. Great. Well, thank you. I'm really happy to be here today. And uh, it's the first time I've ever given a talk to a computer before, so I'm learning as I go. So my basic interest is population genetics and for actually for 50 years, I've been trying to apply population genetics to problems in conservation. I have a couple of issues I'd like to talk about today that are relevant for grizzly bears or related to genetics. Next slide. So an overview of my talk, uh, I have three main points. The first is that the Northern Continental Divide ecosystem population cannot be delisted under the Endangered Species Act because it's not a listable or delistable entity. My second point is the Yellowstone ecosystem population is not viable in the long term without genetic connectivity to other populations. And my third point is that the only way to recover grizzly bears is to protect habitat linkages between all of the recovery areas. Next slide. So there's a lot of talk about delisting the NCDE ecosystem. And 
I would like to ask the question, is the NCDE system a listable or delistable entity under the Endangered Species Act? Next slide. So under the, the law the, in the ESA, you can list or delist three different entities, a species, a subspecies, or a distinct population segment, or DPS. Well, it's clear that the NCDE is not a separate species. It's not a separate subspecies. So it could only be listed or delisted under the DPS provision. Next slide. And the official policy of interpreting the ESA of the Fish and Wildlife Service is that to be a distinct population segment, the population has to be both discrete from other populations in the same species. And it also has to be significant with regard to the species for which it belongs. And it's the first criterion that we're interested in. Next slide, please. So the NCDE is not discrete or separate from the Cabinet Yak or the Selkirk populations. Therefore, it is not eligible to be delisted under the ESA, and it could only be considered for delisting under the ESA if it were included with the Cabinet Yak and the Selkirk populations as a distinct population segment. My second issue is, is the Yellowstone population viable in the long term without genetic connectivity to other populations? And, and the issue here is inbreeding depression. So when you have an isolated population, eventually there will be matings between related individuals. And we know from studies with many all other species that in general, there will be some reduction in fitness of individuals who are produced by matings between related individuals. And the next slide shows the effect of that in a population. So if we start at the top, so we have a small population size, that will bring about going down and clockwise, small population size will lead to increased inbreeding which, as I just said, will lead to decreased reproduction and survival, which will then lead to reduced population growth rate, which will then further feed back into small population size. So this has been called the extinction vortex because once we get into this position of a small population size and inbreeding, we have a positive feedback, which leads to increased probability of extinction of a population. Next slide, please. So to look at the Yellowstone, we can use the criterion of under the 2016 strategy of maintaining at least 500 bears. Next slide. So I looked at this issue by using a series of computer simulations, which simulate the viability of populations, including the demographic parameters plus incorporating genetics using the program Vortex. So, and I've used a carrying capacity in this population of 500 bears as was in that criterion. And this is a really busy slide, but this is sort of the meat of what I'm talking about. So we have on the left from the y-axis is the probability of persistence. So initially at year zero, we have 100, all the populations are present and time is on going to the right on the x-axis. This goes up to 200 years. And so we can see, looking at the three lines, that there is some loss of populations after 100 years. And the three lines represent three different inbreeding depression scenarios. So the top line is with no inbreeding depression. So we can see with no inbreeding depression, a population of 500 bears has a very high probability of persisting 200 years. The next line is with a small amount of inbreeding depression. And these six is just a measure of the geneticist's use of inbreeding depression. It's not really important to understand what that six represents. 
but looking at other populations and other species, it's an intermediate or low amount of inbreeding depression. So we can see that with that amount of inbreeding depression, rather than having 100% of the populations persist for 200 years, we only have about 50%. And finally, if we add the amount of inbreeding depression, which is sort of the average in many populations, looking at the number 12, we have approximately 10% of the population persisting for 200 years. So there's two main points here that I would like to show. The first is that inbreeding depression will reduce the probability of persistence of a population of 500 bears and quite substantially with just a reasonable amount of inbreeding depression. And finally, we, we don't see this effect until after 100 years because it'll take a while in a long-lived animal like a grizzly bear before there is inbreeding. But we have to remember, as we'll see and most people know, the Yellowstone population has already been isolated for 100 years. So we're not starting at 0 0.0, we're actually starting at 0.100 on this slide. Next slide. So what, since inbreeding would be a problem even in a reasonably large population like Yellowstone, what do we need to do to recover grizzly bear populations? And for this, I'm just going to use the uh, grizzly, Governor's Grizzly Bear Advisory Council. Their, their own experts have presented them with a theoretical basis for connectivity brief which I think really does a good job of summarizing the question of what do we need to do to recover grizzly bears. So the basic biology is presented in that first quote on this slide that the best case scenario is the existence of multiple grizzly bear populations that exchange individuals but have somewhat independent dynamics and this is known as a metapopulation. So I think this is fairly basic population biology part of, of their brief. And the next slide is what does this mean in terms of managing or trying to maintain grizzly bears? Next slide. So according to the support team, and I agree with this, that for long-term connectivity of subpopulations is necessary and achievable and that we're closer to achieving this for grizzly bears than we have for any time in the last 100 years. However, there has been no genetic or demographic connectivity to date between the Yellowstone and other populations. And I think the last sentence sums up my point. Achieving this goal will be a challenge that will require dedicated effort and resources. So final, so the only way that we can recover grizzly bears in the lower 48 states is to protect the habitat linkages so that these populations are connected to each other. Final slide, please. And again, this is just a summary of, of my three main points. And I'll just let you take a look at it. All right, well, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Elmendorf. And um, that obviously we have gotten some questions during that time and we'll be able to bring those up later. Um, but right now we're going to move ahead with um, uh, Mr. Bader's uh, slide deck. So I'll pull that up and um, we can start there, which looks a little familiar. Yep, uh, one, one bleeds into the other. Well, thanks, Adam. Uh, this first slide really just shows the, the five recovery areas in the Northern Rockies and potential core habitat and then linkages and the area with the lines on it there between the cabinet yak, the NCDE and the Bitterroot is the nine mile demographic connectivity area. And this was established by the grizzly bear conservation strategy and the purpose of the DCA is continual occupancy by female grizzly bears with cubs. So grizzly bear recovery in the Bitterroot is dependent on natural migration by female grizzly bears from the NCDE and the Nine Mile DCA is the most direct route to the Bitterroot. Next please. Uh, these uh, ge geometric shapes are just for uh, conceptual purposes, they're not actual home ranges, but what I want to show here is as you can see, 
male grizzly bears have far larger home ranges than females, and that has implications for how they disperse. Uh, next, please. So when uh, female grizzly bears, they disperse, it's very dis important to demographic connectivity. And when female young go on their own, they set up small ranges that are wholly within or significantly overlap with the maternal range, while males set up larger ranges, spatially explicit from the maternal range. Therefore, their rate of movement away from the maternal range is different. Therefore, we should understand that getting female grizzly bears into the Bitterroot will not be a dash between ecosystems, but rather a relay based upon stepping stones of secure and substantially roadless habitats. Next, please. This new scientific paper by Michael Proctor and others finds that above about one mile of open road per square mile, grizzly bear survival and population density declines. And they conclude that each bear management unit should not exceed this level. Moreover, at least 60% of each BMU should be roadless secure habitat greater than 2,500 acres. And they say the priority areas for application of these parameters is, quote, in threatened populations, in areas where roads occur in the highest quality habitats within an adjacent identified linkage areas between population units, unquote. Next, please. The primary effect of roads and grizzly bears is direct mortality by humans with guns. And this comes through poaching, surprise encounters, and defense of life and mistaken ID. One study found that 84% of all grizzly bear mortalities occurred within 400 feet of a road. Roads also result in habitat loss caused by displacement. When open road density exceeds about one mile per square mile, survival declines precipitously and habitat loss is severe. So on the graph on the right, uh, we look at the x-axis on the bottom, that's in kilometers. So uh, 0 0.6 is just a roughly one mile per square mile, and you can see that survival here expressed as lambda just goes down dramatically as you increase above those levels. Uh, next, please. Uh, this shows British Columbia, and uh, this is the effect of, primarily the effect of roads, and as you can see, the southern border that uh, borders the U.S., all the populations that are either extinct uh, extremely threatened, as in the North Cascades, or threatened. Uh, so there's not a lot of, uh, there's really not a source for the U.S. anymore, so I think that's important. Next, please. This shows uh, the nine-mile demographic connectivity area, and in the center, the Soldier Butler project area. That kind of illustrates how movement is expected to go from the NCDE across the DCA up to the cabinet yak, which is currently also really genetically isolated, and then also south towards the Bitterroot, the Great Burn, and into the whole uh, Selway Bitterroot region. Next, please. Uh, Paul Siraki and I authored a new report on road density in the Nine Mile DCA. And as you can see in this slide, the road network is massive with more than 3,100 miles of roads open road density is four times that recommended by Proctor et al. to support females with cubs and secure core greater than 2,500 acres is just 12.8% or about one fifth of that required. And the other areas are too small and scattered to be effective. So therefore the Flathead Lolo Bitterroot Citizen Task Force recently sent a 60 day notice of intent to sue the US Fish and Wildlife Service and Forest Service over the Soldier Butler project, which is in the heart of the Nine Mile DCA. The existing road density is a major impediment to female grizzly bears both occupying the DCA and reaching the Bitterroot, and Soldier Butler adds new permanent and temporary roads and rescinds previous commitments to decommission roads. So that's what I've got for there. So thank you, Adam. All right. Well, I appreciate both those presentations and all the questions that have come in from our attendees. Uh, thank you again, everybody, and um, I'll go ahead and bring us back uh, to our view here and get underway with some questions that aren't necessarily related to the science, which uh, we've been hearing about, uh, but more to uh, some of the legal issues surrounding uh, grizzly bear recovery. Um, and these obviously will be directed uh, 
towards Pete, uh, but obviously anyone can weigh in here on our panel. Uh, so yesterday, you know, the Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals issued a major ruling regarding delisting of the Yellowstone population. And Pete, can you explain the ruling and what it means? He needs to unmute. Um, yeah, we'll, we'll let Pete start over as he takes his microphone off mute. Hi, sorry, Adam. Um, at the outset, I want to acknowledge, I was not an attorney of record in the, in the case um, that was decided yesterday. It was handled primarily by Matt Bishop of our office in Helena and by Tim Presso of Earth Justice, who I think just did an extraordinary job and have for years in, in prosecuting cases related to grizzly bears um, in the West. Yesterday's decision was um, an affirmance uh, by the court of a prior district court decision by Judge Christensen in Missoula. And it, um, the court affirmed on all three grounds that Judge Christensen had related to finding why the US Fish and Wildlife Service violated the Endangered Species Act in 2017 when it simultaneously created a distinct population segment uh, for the grizzly bears in the greater Yellowstone ecosystem and delisted it. And the three grounds for the court uh, finding that that decision was illegal, um, and they're relatively simple, honestly. The first one was uh, that the Fish and Wildlife Service failed when it delisted the distinct population segment to consider the effect of that decision on the remaining grizzly bear populations in the Northern Continental Divide, the Selkirks and the like. Second, the Ninth Circuit determined that fish and wildlife failed to use the best available science when it found that grizzly bears uh, in the greater Yellowstone were not um, genetically threatened in the long term by a lack of diversity. And Dr. Allendorf just spoke to that a moment ago. Most of the studies uh, are, are conclusive that in fact bears in the greater Yellowstone do suffer a great threat to genetic diversity without um, either translocation or natural migration into the area. And then the third um, reason why the courts found the 2017 decision to be illegal is it's a little bit wonky, but it's about how grizzly bears are counted and it was about the Fish and Wildlife Service uh, refusing to do what's called a recalibration, that if it were move, to move to one different model of how it would count bears, the courts were fearful that what would occur would be that bears would be counted that didn't exist, and that that would enable, for example, the states of Idaho and Wyoming uh, to have more active management of remaining grizzly bears. So those were the three holdings of the Ninth Circuit yesterday morning. Uh, the next step in that case, that it, the matter has been remanded back to the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. Um, it has discretion to do uh, either to come back and address what the court found to be the infirmities in its original decision or to make a different one. And, uh, and, and perhaps it will under a different administration. I think that remains to be seen. But I think, you know, for, for the time being, grizzly bears in the lower 48 are fully protected, and that is a very good thing. So Adam, I, I wanna switch, um, anticipating some questions later, I wanna switch to another piece of active litigation that may be of interest to folks on the phone. Um, um, myself and Dana Johnson, who is a staff attorney at Wilderness Watch, represent Guardians, Wilderness Watch, uh, Friends of the Clear Water and the Western Watersheds Project. In a case against both the US Forest Service and the Fish and Wildlife Service related to a 1995 decision by the Forest Service to abdicate control of the use of bait to hunt black bears on national forest lands. And there are two states in the West that do that, and they are perhaps not surprisingly the states of Wyoming and the state of Idaho, excuse me, the state of Idaho and the state of Wyoming, yes. And, and the result of that decision has been, since 1995, a number of grizzlies being shot on national forest lands at bait stations, as Mike mentioned, perhaps because of uh, mistaken identity, uh, perhaps because of um, the hunter believing that uh, he or she was threatened and, that, and, the, and the sort. We assert in that lawsuit that uh, continued baiting in these areas violates the Endangered Species Act because when the decision was made in 95, 
to allow this to occur, the Fish and Wildlife Service set zero as the permissible take limit of dead grizzlies. And that has in fact been exceeded as both Idaho and Wyoming admit in the lawsuit. So we are in the midst right now of trying to prosecute a case that we are hopeful in the long term will result in greater control, if not cessation of the use of baits in national forests um, in Idaho and Wyoming that are providing exactly what both Mike and Fred spoke about, which is important habitat linkages. And if you look at, if you look at the migration patterns of many grizzlies coming out of the greater Yellowstone area or coming out of the Northern Continental uh, Divide area, they're going southwest and west. And many of them are going toward the Bitterroot, which was previously, um, at least recently, unoccupied grizzly habitat. But last year alone, in 2019, a grizzly was found in the Kelly Creek drainage. Uh, another grizzly was found probably uh, outside of Elk City. And so grizzlies are moving into these areas. And I think the intent of the lawsuit is to ensure that uh, when they do naturally migrate as they are, that they are protected and that they're not uh, lured into areas where they're going to get shot for a number of reasons. So that lawsuit is, is pending before a, a magistrate in the district of uh, Idaho and Boise. So those are the two suits right now. Um, that's all I've got on those things. Um, Great. Well, I do appreciate that background and explanation. And uh, we are hopeful that uh, the populations will remain protected. Um, and we'll have to wait to see how the district court uh, rules on the remand. Um, and of course, we're ever eager uh, to see our bear baiting case move forward. Um, I know the courts are sometimes uh, glacial in their uh, decision making. Uh, so I think at this point in time, it makes sense to maybe take some questions from our audience. And I know that several of you have posed them. So going back um, to looking at the distinct population segments, I, I know that Dr. Allendorf, you were talking about earlier, uh, there's a question, is the reason the other populations can't be listed as a DPS as opposed to the Yellowstone population because there's some degree of interaction between them? Yes, that's why the NCDE cannot be listed as a distinct population segment because it's not discrete from the Selkirks and, and Cabinet Yaks. So if you put those three populations together, then I think you could make a good argument that that is a distinct population segment, but not the separate populations. Great. Um, and then kind of related, you know, obviously genetic viability is crucial. Um, and there, <laughs> so one of the questions uh, obviously is why is there a push to kill bears uh, via baiting uh, and killing bears in their dens? This seems immoral as well as unhealthy. Uh, of bears become, as bears become an issue with ranchers, why don't they trap and relocate the bears? Not sure that one has an easy answer. Well, I can take a quick stab at it. Uh, you know, I think the main thing is we want to teach people how to coexist with the, gri with the grizzly bears. And there's a lot of tools out there. And, you know, the Blackfoot Challenge has done a pretty good job in the upper Blackfoot of, and it's kind of become second nature for those residents, but as the population expands, you know, their, their distribution area, they're, they're getting into areas where people aren't used to having grizzlies around. And so we're sort of playing catch up because the bears are, their, their expansion is outpacing the management response, which always lags pretty far behind. And so that gap is, is the real threat. And, uh, I guess I would put it that way. I don't want to get into people's heads about why they want to shoot bears. There's all kinds of reasons, but I disagree with all of them, of course. And, and certainly, if we want to have connectivity between populations, every bear that's in between those populations is extremely valuable and cannot afford to be lost. Great. Uh, may I add something to that? Um, I, I want to, uh, I agree with what Mike just said, and I want to highlight one of the slides that he showed, which was lines on the map showing where, grizzly bear, where the grizzly bear recovery area is designated. 
and then coloring outside of that area where grizzly bears in fact exist. And that's important because related to baiting, for example, the state of Wyoming does not allow baiting within the, within the recovery area. And it excludes baiting in some hunt units outside of the recovery area. But there are many hunt units where bears in fact exist where baiting continues. And, you know, apart from the ethics of using bait to hunt an animal, which is not part of this lawsuit, these, these plaintiffs are focusing on whether it is appropriate to have baits placed in grizzly habitat. That's what the case is about. And it's about not only the prospect that these animals will get shot, it's also about how it uh, changes their behavior and changes their food sources and perhaps habituates grizzly bears to the presence of people and or domesticated food, all of which are terrible for the long-term survival of, of grizzly bears. So the baiting thing is really a lot, it, it, it's not about the ethic of a particular method of hunting. It's about the propriety of doing this where it affects a listed species. Great, that's really good context, uh, Pete, and I appreciate that. Um, and it seems, you know, with the issue of connectivity and genetic exchange that the Bitterroot recovery zone is going to be absolutely crucial to the recovery of grizzly bears uh, in all of the uh, recovery zones. Um, but I'm not the scientific expert, so I was hoping um, Dr. Allendorf or, or Mike, you may be able to speak to that. Uh, just how important is the Bitterroot recovery zone? I'll, I'll let Mike speak to that. Well, I don't think we can have grizzly bear recovery in the Northern Rockies without the Bitterroot because one of the things Fred's work has shown and Lee Metzger and some other people I've worked with is that a, a, a viable population for several hundred years is gonna be somewhere between 2,500, maybe even as many as 5,000 individuals. And certainly none of the recovery areas are large enough by themselves to support that number of bears. and so. The only way we can achieve that number in the lower 48 is to get a substantial breeding population established in central Idaho because it's just a massive area of wildlands, wilderness and roadless areas. And so it needs to be the third major population along with NCDE and the Bitterroot. And then uh, obviously uh, rescuing the Selkirks and Cabinet Yak and building those up, but then having pockets of demography, that means female grizzly bears in these uh, roadless areas and linkages in between them. So without the Bitterroot, we just can't get to those viable numbers. And so, and there's just no reason not to have bears there. It's bear heaven. There's great food there. There's a lot of resources. Uh, we just need to improve some of the attitudes. And, uh, you know, that's, that's my short answer is got to have the Bitterroot or we're not going to have a recovery. Sure. And then obviously the impediments, uh, barriers of getting bears back into the Bitterroot um, is front and center. I mean, bears are making their way there now, uh, but obviously roads um, seem to be a major uh, barrier to natural migration. Um, but we always wrestle with this idea of what kind of roads. Um, so what extent can uh, and do grizzly bears use over and underpasses on major roads. And how is that different, that issue different than the forest roads and the map that you had shown Mike earlier? Well, the issue of passage across highways is a totally different thing. And it's kind of in its nascent uh, area because we ha don't have a lot of evidence of bears using them yet. But uh, there is up in Canada that's, that's, you know, they've shown to be to work real well. So that's real essential because the big barrier it seems to be for female grizzly bears is I-90 and any four lane highway. Males have been crossing I-90. They've been getting down into the Bitterroot, but tougher for females. So we need better highway passage structures. And then it, there has to be something for them to get to on the other side. So you don't want to have a highway passage structure that leads into a habitat sink or mortality sink filled with roads. And so the forest roads are different because they, 
they really bring access to people with guns. And so it's a whole different thing rather than getting struck by vehicles on the highway, they're being struck by bullets from guns. And the other real effect of the roads is, is habitat displacement from habitat that expresses itself in direct habitat loss. And that reduces the carrying capacity of the area. And the, if the roadless areas aren't close enough together, then the females can't get from one to the other. So it's really uh, two things. It's road density and the number of open roads. And even with the closed roads, we have trouble because the Forest Service doesn't do a very good job of closing them, uh, patrolling them, gates are busted, driven around, destroyed. And so that's a real issue and their enforcement has been pretty lax, to be honest. Uh, well, thank you for that reply, Mike. And it seems to be that the linkage areas also need to have good habitat security in order to function um, as linkages. Um, do we have a sense of where the, how many roads are within those linkage areas or the, or the road densities? It's, it seems like they cross a lot of land ownership. So the, the highway crossings, if they're effective, will be a piece of the puzzle, but then you know, what are the barriers within those linkage areas, I guess is my question. Well, the, the two demographic connectivity areas that have been designated, there's the one in the Salish between the NCDE and the Cabinet Yak and then the Nine Mile that I mentioned. And their road densities are completely off the charts. And so if this is what the government is planning to give the grizzly bears in terms of linkages, we're not going to have effective linkage. And so what needs to happen is we need better habitat road management standards in these designated demographic connectivity areas and then let that serve as a, a model for other areas because we certainly would want to see habitat linkages protected between the NCDE, the GYE and, and the Bitterroot, that's, that's critical. So uh, there's no way to have a linkage with no management standards, uh, just, you know, it won't function. You're, you're, you're basing your whole strategy on luck rather than an actual strategy. Great. Well, I know we're kind of jumping around uh, with some of our questions, but just a quick one. Um, I kind of missed how many grizzly bears are, do we have right now? Well, the best guess is about 1,700 in the lower 48 states. That might be a little higher, a little low, depend on who you ask, but that's, that's about it. And I, I think the number is 37, you can confirm, that's the number of bears that have been killed just this year. Is that, is that right? I, I mean, I know that in the NCDE, what has been reported is 21. That was as of the end of, of June. So, but those are only the verified known mortalities and does not include the unknown, which can often be, there can be one for every known, there's another one that is unknown. And then how does that affect recovery? Oh, go ahead, Pete. I, I just want to add just, and I think probably everybody on the phone may know this, but you know, when Mike talks about the absolute numbers, that's correct, but in the mid 90% of that is in two ecosystems where we're lacking bears are in the other four, the Selkirks, the Cabinet Yak, the Bitterroot, and the North Cascades, where there are relatively robust populations in the Northern Continental Divide and, and Greater Yellowstone. So the problem um, is in part the absolute number of bears, but it is surely the distribution of that number across the ecosystems where they should exist. Right. Well, and you mentioned the North Cascades, and we've gotten a couple of questions related to that. So, you know, two days ago, the Department of Interior scrap the reintroduction plan for grizzlies in the North Cascades. Um, can a Biden administration um, change that or reinitiate the NEPA process? Well, the answer is yes. I mean, and the irony was the Trump administration spoke out of both sides of, I mean, Zinke was for it prior to <laughs> the latest secretary being against it. So, um, you know, it's a political decision. It isn't based on uh, recovery of, of grizzlies in the lower 48. And uh, yes, I think a different administration could make a different call on that. Great. Um, and so maybe going back here to the Northern Rockies, uh, how do we achieve management standards on national forest in the Bitterroot ecosystem? 
uh, which are comparable to standards uh, that we see in other recovery areas. Is that just simply through forest planning or is there another mechanism? That might be a legal question. I'm sorry, could you, could you restate that? Sure, so how do we achieve management standards on national forest uh, lands in the Bitterroot ecosystem, uh, which are comparable to the standards we have in the other recovery areas? Uh, is that simply through forest plan revision where that's the process where the Forest Service establishes um, these kinds of standards or is there another mechanism that we could rely on? Well, I, you know, I think um, the answer is there isn't a single answer. If you think of links, for example, um, links are managed under a regional framework that the Forest Service adopted working in concert with the Fish and Wildlife Service. And those management standards ultimately uh, showed up in amended forest plans or showed up in projects. So you could go that route or you could have um, a Fish and Wildlife Service with integrity set conditions either on regional projects or programmatic decisions or, or site specific ones like those that Mike is involved in where you have better management standards for bears in the areas. So there, I think there's two pathways to getting that done. Great. Um, well, looking at the, the recent uh, ruling from the Ninth Circuit and the Greater Yellowstone Ecosystem and Christensen's ruling uh, since it's going back uh, into his court, um, is the effect on the remnant population limited to the recovery areas and the DPSs or does the remnant population include effect on those bears outside the recovery area? If I'm understanding that question correctly. Well, I, I don't know. Bears are listed independent of whether they're inside a recovery area or not. Okay. So, the, and I think the recovery area boundaries are frankly outdated. And particularly given what we're seeing with the natural migration and growth of population. So, Grizzlies are protected independent of the recovery areas. The recovery areas were set up long ago for a different purpose. And now we're, you know, in 2020, we're in a, a different world related to where we ought to be with grizzly management. And if I'd add to that real quickly, one of the issues going on in the Bitterroot right now is uh, the Fish and Wildlife Service is analyzing where they think Section 7 consultations should take place. and. Certainly, we would be opposed to any, you know, just drawing a line around some circle around uh, verified observations and saying, well, that's, you know, really, the, you got to look at the whole area as being likely occupied or, or will be. And one of the issues that's come up in legal rulings, especially the one up in the cabinet, Yak and Selkirk, dealt with what they call the boars or bears outside the recovery zones. And, there's pretty good ruling up there that the Forest Service had to look at the uh, ineffectiveness of their closures, their their closures during the projects, and and uh, look at that effect and add it into the road density analysis. And the Forest Service had appealed it to the ninth, but then dropped it. So a lot of projects are being reanalyzed with that. That's certainly part of what we're looking at with Soldier Butler. But I, yeah, as Pete said, you know, it's like a briefcase. The uh, ESA travels with the grizzly wherever it goes. And, uh, and so that's making it a sticky thing for the Fish and Wildlife Service because they'd like to keep them inside these uh, small uh, boundaries. And so uh, I think that uh, the groups that are pushing for consultations and, and, and uh, terms and conditions on some of these projects are really pushing this in the right direction. Great. So just to be clear then, the, the Yellowstone population uh, isn't the only protected population. All the recovery, all the bears in the recovery zones and those leaving have protections under the ESA. Great. Um, so you mentioned uh, in the slide earlier the um, Grizzly Bear Advisory Committee. Um, can can somebody explain what that, or a council, can someone explain what the council is and what it may be doing? Maybe not. Uh, yeah, I can. I, I'm just not wanting to answer too many questions, but no, the governor set up a grizzly bear advisory committee and he took 
applications and they selected, I don't know how many, 18, I think, out of 150 some applicants. And their charge is to come up with recommendations for how grizzly bears should be managed throughout Montana. And those recommendations will be carried forth into an environmental impact statement that the state is currently working on. Uh, that would be a new grizzly bear management EIS for the plan for the whole state. There used to be one for Southwest Montana around Yellowstone and then NCDE. And now they're just looking at the whole thing as a, a statewide thing. And of course the issue of hunting is uh, really entwined in that and, and very controversial. So the council has been meeting for about a year and they're supposed to have really their final meeting this month before their, their real final meeting in August. By August 31st, they're charged to, to produce their final document of recommendations. So I encourage people to get on their portal at Fish Wild. You could just Google GBAC and I think it'd take you there and you can comment and, and really weigh in against hunting and, uh, and, and, and weigh in for linkages and other things because they've, they've really been led by the nose, I think, by the agencies to uh, implement a vision that the agencies would like to have, which is quite a bit different from what the general public would like to see. So they're pretty gung-ho to get hunting uh, going. So I'm sure they're real disappointed in the GYE ruling, but uh, that's where it is. And uh, in addition to commenting on the council's um, portal, um, Wild Earth Guardians also has a, uh, an alert that I'm going to share in the um, chat window for everybody. Uh, if you follow that link, you can add your name to uh, a letter that we are going to be sharing with the council ahead of its July meeting, which I think is on the 22nd uh, of this month. Um, and so maybe uh, there's been a lot of talk about hunting and the council and what it is um, able to do. And what happens if the council recommends hunting or if Montana uh, tries to initiate a hunting season uh, before bears are delisted? Can they even do that? Yes, uh, it's not easy, but they would, uh, they would organize it as an agricultural damage hunt. And I think that's where they're headed because they, don't, they know they're probably not gonna be able to delist NCDE anytime within the next 12 months at, at a minimum. And so they want to hunt, they don't want to wait. And they had had a hunt after the grizzly was listed in 75. And there was a hunt that continued up through the fall of 91 in the NCDE under that rubric. So they're really rallying the ranchers on the East front to support that. And uh, so I think that's, that's something we have to be aware of uh, that is at least an attempt that might be tried. Pete, did you have more to add to that? Um, I have a, a bit of a digression. I just want to say it before I forget it. I, I also want to um, mention that Guardians has notified Burlington Northern uh, Railway of its intent to sue it if it does not, uh, in the near term, submit to the Fish and Wildlife Service uh, a habitat conservation plan and obtain an incidental take permit for, um, to cover the fact that its trains are periodically killing bears, particularly given that the High Line in Montana cuts right through the middle of the Northern Continental Divide ecosystem. I just wanted to mention that as a, another piece of um, kind of legal stuff that's going on, percolating in the background. Great, I appreciate that, Pete. I, I know that was in the works and wasn't quite sure how much we would talk about it today. Uh, so thank you for mentioning that. Um, Maybe going back to genetic interchange, uh, there's the question of just how effective would it be just physically moving bears between recovery zones? Um, is, is this like a Band-Aid solution? Um, would it be effective? Um, what are your thoughts about that? Well, I'll, I'll ask, I'll let somebody else answer that because genetically, that could work, but I think in terms of long-term recovery, that is not a viable solution. Yeah, Adam, you know, that's a great question, but uh, there's been a lot of translocation of bears to the cabinet yak to augment. And if you really dig into the science, the failure rate is really high. And uh, 
It's a real problem because bears have a homing instinct and you generally have to move them over a hundred miles away from where they are to break that. They'll come right back to, I helped trap some bears in Yellowstone once. We moved a female and cubs way to the, from outside Gardner all the way down to the Snake River. And two days later, she was back in the Gallatin Range. You know, they crossed mountain ranges they had never been in before. And so it's very tough to, to make that stick. You would have to keep moving bears. And then the other issue is where is the source? If you don't have a, any independently viable population, how can you be taking female grizzly bears out of it and moving them? So it takes longer to do it the hard way, but the hard way is the best way. And that's to, to protect these linkages as Fred said, because uh, you know, if you start, it's like the North Cascades, it's a, it's a start and stop thing. And, and so they could authorize it one year, the next year it could be canceled. It's just not a very uh, efficacious way to go, in my opinion. Great. Well, I appreciate that uh, reply. Um, and maybe just to clarify, so if the grizzly bears are already listed as a species under the ESA and the lower 48, why is it important that the uh, NCDE and the Cabinet Yak and the Selway areas be combined as a single population uh, segment. I mean, what protect, would that offer any pr more protections to that population? Um, just how, why is that important? Well, I, I think that the problem is that Fish and Wildlife Service way back when never really followed the Endangered Species Act. So they never identified distinct population segments of grizzly bears in lower 48 states. So they came up with these eco, five ecosystems here in the Northern Rockies, which really have no meaning under the ESA. And so they tried to deal with that when they tried to delist Yellowstone by designating that a DPS, because they knew they couldn't be listed without it being a DPS. And so the, the problem is the, the legality of what can be listed or delisted versus what really needs to be done in terms of managing. And under the ESA, there's no way in my reading of the law and the biology, there's no way to separate the Cabinet Yak, Selkirks, and Northern Continental Divide into separate DPSs. They would, they would compose, comprise just one DPS. So it really doesn't matter in terms of management, that, that's a separate issue. This is the legal issue in terms of protecting them under the ESA. Great. Um, maybe going back, uh, there was a question I um, missed regarding an agricultural hunt. Um, if that were actually to become reality, which I, I think would be hard pressed um, to make any make it past any legal challenges. Um, but if that were to be the case, uh, would hunters be required to target specific problem bears? Quote, unquote, problem. Well, that's been discussed. And I think the problem with that is it's an ethical problem. Uh, a guided hunt using radio collars. I mean, that's not allowed in any other hunting of any other animal. And so that's that's an that's an uh, an assassination almost rather than a, a management plan. And so, what we really need to do is to, is to secure the attractants and and electrify the chicken coops and and things like that and break that habituation process. And then we wouldn't have any need for that uh, conflict resolution. Great. Um, and I know we're getting to the top of the hour. Um, so I really just want to say thank you um, to all the panelists and Judy for moderating and all the attendees and the great questions. Um, I'd just like to maybe leave with the last question um, before we wrap up. And it's kind of a conceptual one, but do we, do we need new laws or policies to ensure the full recovery of the grizzly bears and have any of those been proposed? Yeah, Raul Grijalva has uh, introduced the Grizzly Bear Protection Act. It's kind of patterned after the Bald Eagle Protection Act, and I think that would be crucial. The other phase is the Grizzly Bear Recovery Plan is 27 years old, and it's not based on current 
best science and it, it needs to be revised. And I'm not necessarily advocating this, but one possibility is to designate a Northern Rockies recovery area that includes all the suitable habitat and the linkages and uh, abandons that idea of just having these core uh, wilderness and national park areas that be the basis of the recovery area because those aren't necessarily where the best habitat is because they're the highest elevation and harsher conditions and so a lot of the best foods on the periphery and so uh, those are two ways that we could gain better protection but I, I would also just take my hat off to the environmental groups the native groups and the environmental attorneys who've been creating good law through the courts and so it, there's not one magic bullet here it's it's a a, a, a broader approach of different tentacles if you, if you will Fabulous. Well, again, thank you, uh, everybody, for joining us here today. Um, all the attendees will, you know, you'll be getting an email uh, with a link to today's recording. Um, also, we will include an invite to our next uh, webinar on this issue. If there's questions that uh, you think of after uh, today, or if you didn't get answered, uh, there'll be another opportunity next week. Um, I think it's July 15th for our next webinar. And again, look for that invite here shortly. Uh, so I just will leave it there. Thank you everybody for attending today. And it's been uh, a real honor to have moderated the panel. Thank you again.